Welcome back to Anime Lockdown. This is Shoujo Manga's Lost Generation with Megan. Uh, welcome to Anime Lockdown. Thank you. All right. Uh, and thank you all for everybody who showed up in the stream today. So I presume that if you are here right now watching this panel, that you are a fan of shoujo manga, as you should be, as am I. Because shoujo manga is a wonderful art form in its own right, with a long and fascinating history. And it's that history in particular that I want to talk about today. Because... So much of shoujo manga fandom is focused on the here and the now. You know, what's popular now, what's current now. And I want to focus more on its early history and its origins in particular. There we go. So I want to pose a question to you all in the, in the chat. When did shoujo manga begin? When did shoujo manga become something separate from other forms of manga? Odds are good that some of you might not know. In fact, you're honestly, your average manga reader in Japan might not know. But odds are good if you have some idea, it's going to be one of these two milestones in shoujo manga history. Some of you might look all the way back to Princess Knight, which was created by Osamu Tezuka and originally published in 1953. And that's not an unreasonable assumption. 1953 is nearly 70 years ago, and it's a very early manga with a female protagonist. Therefore, shoujo manga must be just another creation of the so-called god of manga. Others might look a little more forward in time to the early 1970s and the works of the Magnificent 49ers, artists like Motohagio, Keiko Takamiya, and Ryoko Okeda, just to name a few. And this is... The this is not a completely unreasonable assumption because there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of articles, a lot of panels, including some I have done in the past, that have discussed all the ways that they change shoujo manga and all the genres they help pioneer. But what I want to focus on is the two decades, roughly speaking, in between those points. Because while these these two milestones are important to the history of shoujo manga. It's not really where it truly begins. It's within these two decades, the 50s and the 60s, where many of the narrative conventions and a lot of the aesthetics that have come to define shoujo manga were created by a very talented generation of young women. But this has become something of a lost generation. Its history is very seldom discussed in Japan, and it's pretty much unknown outside of it. So today, I'm going to be discussing th that history and sharing these stories with you. But before we can discuss the innovations they made, we need to understand what shoujo manga was like before that point. Now, of course, you can't have shoujo manga without shoujo magazines. And shoujo magazines date all the way back to the early 1900s although the ideas behind them go back even earlier uh, to the 1870s and 1880s, when the Meiji government made changes in Japanese law that, among other things, allowed young women to attend high school for the first time and encouraged them to become literate. And this became something of a, a social aspirational thing. It was something that a lot of upper and middle class families liked to do because these high schools for girls were less formal education than kind of half regular education and half charm school. But these schools kind of formed their own subculture. And this is where the whole idea of like shoujo culture came into being. It became something more than just a descriptor for a young woman. Uh, it was this subculture that was based around like art and beauty and romanticism. And of course, where there is a subculture, there's money to be made from it. And that's how these magazines came into being. And while they began, the first one dates all the way back to 1902. They really flourished during the Taisho period. So during the 1910s and 20s and into even to the early Showa era into the 1930s. Now, keep in mind, these magazines were very different from, say, your average volume of Nakayoshi or Hana Toyume. These were largely educational tools. The idea is they would help to encourage young girls to foster their creativity and their literacy 
So they were basically literary magazines for teen girls. They were mostly collections of illustrated prose, fiction, and poetry. But they were, some saw these even as more than just mere educational tools. They saw them as a way to basically foster a good society. There was this idea among uh, legislators and moralists in Japan at the time that educating these young women would allow them to become cultured, refined young women who would make good, advantageous marriages and thus become good, dutiful wives. And in turn, they would raise good, intelligent, obedient children who would become useful citizens to Japan. This whole idea was uh, referred to as Ryosai Kenbo, or literally, wise mothers, good wives. Now, that's not to say that there was no levity to be found in these early shoujo magazines. There were comics, and there were similar sorts of lighthearted things. But what was present was decidedly quaint. As you can see here in this reader-submitted comic from 1910. I mean, as you can see, this is, you know, almost like a very basic woodcut style. And because this is so early in the era of cartooning, they actually have to number the panels to tell you which order to read it. But that was kind of the thing of comics, making comics for shoujo magazines at the time was not a prestigious job. Uh, it, cartooning in Japan at the time was m almost entirely done by men. And where they saw the prestige and the money was in newspaper comics or for adult literary magazines and similar sorts of things. Not, you know, making comics for little girls. But there was one man who could be said to be kind of the grandfather of shoujo manga. And that man, his name is Katsuji Matsumoto. He actually started out as an illustrator in the 1920s, but by the 1930s, he kind of shifted towards making comics uh, specifically for the shoujo, early shoujo magazines. Now, they kind of evolved over time. Uh, one of the earliest examples you see here from his Poku-chan series is less of a formal comic and closer to the illustrated storybooks he used to make, albeit an illustrated story with a very fun, stylized, art deco style, as you can see here. Uh, later on, uh, into the late 1930s, and actually had something of a comeback after the war, was Kuru Kuru Kurumi-chan, which was a very simple, cute, gag-based, newspaper-style comic. So he was, he was a very diverse artist, but he was also experimental in some ways. And you can see this in a story that was rediscovered in the early 2000s by a scholar by the name of Ryan Holmberg, who actually uh, wrote a really interesting article about this in the Comics Journal, and this is freely available online. Uh, it is called The Mysterious Clover, written in 1934. This is actually a little short story, a little 16-page booklet that uh, came as part of the magazine. And itself is something of a swashbuckling adventure. It's about a young girl who becomes a Robin Hood style bandit to save her kingdom from a wicked king. So already we're dealing with something that's geared more towards entertainment than education. But as you can see here in this example of the art, you know, Mats uh, Matsumoto is really starting to experiment with layout and style and perspective. It's starting to look something like something that you or I might recognize as manga, shoujo or otherwise. But unfortunately, a lot of the innovations he and other artists of the time made were nearly undone by World War II. Now, compared to boys' magazines of the time, which became increasingly militaristic over time, shoujo magazines were largely left to their own devices. And so they kind of uh, fostered this very lush visual style. And these were Big magazines, we're talking 300 pages usually per issue. But their aesthetic was very Western, very much influenced by like Western fashion and dolls and that sort of thing. And that changed in 1938 when the imperial government laid down uh, a bunch of regulations about uh, basically reducing Western images and Western aesthetics and 
basically anything that was too decadent for Imperial Japan. So they started to crack down on a lot of these shoujo magazines and any writer or editor or artist that didn't fall in line would effectively find themselves blacklisted. These restrictions would grow even stronger in 1941 when the government shut down all but one of the remaining shoujo magazines of the time. And at this point, they begin to change drastically. The government line was that they had to change it for the sake of paper and ink rationing. But behind the scenes, the real answer was that so they could basically turn them into a propaganda piece. So thus, they change from these, you know, lush, full color, 300 page volumes to black and white, 60 page, like crudely put together pamphlets that are mostly full of propaganda pieces. And there's an excellent article by a woman named Catherine Bay, Catherine with a C, Bay like the meme, uh, which is readily available on JSTOR, where she really goes into detail about this. Basically, these magazines were full of a lot of uh, photo essays where showing girls like, oh, look at them. They're working out at school. They're working in the fields. They're working in the factories. They're going to the hospital. And lots of inspirational short stories about young girls making sacrifices and hoping and wishing with their thoughts and prayers for their fathers and brothers at the front lines. But of course, the war eventually came to an end and manga in general, and shoujo manga in particular, made a major comeback after that due to a few different factors. Uh, first of all was the rise in popularity of Akahan, which were these very cheaply printed color original manga stories that originally started out uh, as being kind of a trend in Osaka, but started to spread out to some of the other uh, major Japanese cities of the time. Uh, and the Akahan were a place where a lot of very early uh, manga artists got their start. Uh, it was also during this time period that manga rental shops became popular. While the idea of for-profit lending libraries had been a thing in Japan since the Edo period, they saw their peak in popularity during the occupation and heading into the 1960s. Because at that time, a lot of Japanese people didn't have a lot of money or a lot of space to devote to things like books or magazines for their children. But for literal pocket change, you could go to a manga rental shop and rent the latest volume of a shoujo magazine or even uh, a specially made hardbound original story. And you can rent that and read that for a few days. And it became kind of a, a market onto itself. Uh, there were original shoujo manga stories made specifically for the manga rental shops. The cover you see here is an example of one of those. But part of the Probably the main reason that shoujo manga made a big comeback is that at this point, there were more children than ever that were in need of cheap entertainment. Not just the children who had managed to survive the war, who were desperate for any sort of entertainment, but Japan underwent its own post-war uh, baby boom. So during the 1950s, you had more young children who wanted entertainment and TV didn't really catch on until the next decade. So manga was there to fill that gap. So this is kind of the beginning of what I deem this lost generation, but and already we're seeing some pretty drastic shifts in the audience away from educated young teens to ordinary elementary school age children. But even as many things changed, some things stayed the same behind the scenes. Shoujo manga was still largely made by men, not just the editors, but the men actually making the manga. And some of these men included some many of future shona manga superstars. Now, we've already mentioned Asamu Tezuka, and surprisingly for the many, many manga he made over his lifetime, he actually didn't make a lot of shoujo manga himself. Princess Knight is probably the most notable example. Otherwise, he largely dabbled in it. A few short stories here and there, the sequel to Princess Knight, The Twin Knights, and even some later works such as Marvelous Melmo, which was a magical girl series he published in like the late 60s, early 70s. But he also had an effect on early shoujo manga in other ways. 
Uh, early in his career, he wrote a sort of how-to book called Manga Daigaku, which roughly translates to comic college. And a lot of early shoujo manga artists got inspiration from its pages. Uh, later on, in the 1960s, he founded an independent comics magazine called Com. And some of the later artists from this generation got their start within its pages. Shutaro Ishinomori is another example. Now, of course, if people know him at all, most know him for his shonen work, uh, works like Cyborg 009, or his many tokusatsu-related works. But he got his start in shoujo manga as well, and he stuck with it a lot longer than his peers. He made them well into the 1960s. And he also made a lot of works in a lot of different genres, uh, not just melodramas like his debut work, She Wore a Blue Ribbon, but mysteries like Dragon Pond, which was kind of his breakout work of that time, and even into later works like Sarutobi Echan, which is a magical girl series, or even more experimental fare like Fantasy World June. Uh, Leiji Matsumoto got a start in manga, in shoujo manga, you know, long before Harlock ever sailed the stars, long before the Galaxy Express made its first stop, Heck, even before he even went by Leiji, as many of his early works were made under his given name of Akira. Now, admittedly, his shoujo manga doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to the sci-fi sign-in works that he is best known for. Uh, a lot of his early shoujo manga were either mystery stories or stories about cute animals, things like cats, dogs, or as you can see here, squirrels. But in later years, he would actually credit his time as a shoujo mangaka with helping him to refine his signature art style and to help him better understand and create female characters. And as we'll see a little later, he did have some help in regards to that. Tetsuya Chiba, uh, of course, he's best known as the artist behind the classic boxy manga, Ashita no Jo. But before Joe ever threw his first punch, Chiba had already made a name for himself in shoujo manga, writing a number of sensitive, kind of slice of life style shoujo stories that were very influential in their day. Uh, artists like Motohagio and Keiko Takamiya would cite some of these as favorites of theirs as children and influences on their own work. Now, I could go on and on in this vein, particularly when you get into the early history of magical girls in general, but I like to think I've made my point that shoujo manga in the 1950s was very much kind of the playground of a lot of future superstars of manga. So why didn't they stick around? Well, there was the fact that these were cis men and they didn't really understand the perspective of their young female audience. It was not for lack of trying on their part, in later interviews, Tetsuya Chiba talked about how he would consult with his then assistant, later his wife, for ideas and perspectives, while Leiji Matsumoto would watch movies starring female heroines to try to get inspiration. But that was something that they always struggled with. There was also the fact that by design, they treated shoujo manga as something of a stepping stone. As popular as shoujo manga was at this time, shonen manga was even bigger. And because of that, it was a very competitive field and it was very hard for a new artist to make their debut. And in comparison, shoujo manga was far less competitive. So a promising artist who get their start in shoujo manga, you know, they could build a name for themselves, they can build up an audience, they can make some connections within the industry that would make it easier for them to eventually make the move to shonen manga. And while this wasn't as much of a common attitude with the artists of shoujo manga in the 1950s, there was still an idea among the editors of the magazines of this time that felt that they still had to set a good example for their very young readership. And so that did put some restrictions on the kind of stories that these artists could tell. And understandably, some of them would chafe under this kind of restriction. But amazingly, you know, in spite of the competition they had to face, in spite of some of the institutional sexism of the time, there were some women who managed to find success in the 1950s as shoujo mangaka. Uh, one of the most prominent was Toshiko Ueda, uh, 
who actually got her start in her career in the 1930s as an assistant to Katsuji Matsumoto. This unto itself is notable because that was a time where Japanese women in general were not encouraged to work, much less work in a field that was viewed as poor and masculine as cartooning. And while she wrote a number of series through the 1950s, her best known and most successful one was 1957's Fuichin-san, which was about the adventures of the titular Fuichin, who was a, you know, a young, spunky girl growing up in kind of a, a rosy pre-war China. And Ueda took inspiration from her own childhood for this story, as she spent part of it in occupied Manchuria. Uh, Fuichin Song was very popular in its day. At its peak, Ueda would get three bags of fan mail per day. And it was also something of a critical darling at the time. And because of that, she would become the first woman to win the Shogakukan Manga Award in 1960. And her story continues to inspire people to this day. Uh, during the 2010s, uh, there was actually a sign-in manga uh, done by Mayumi Moriyama based on her life and the creation of Fuichin San called Fuichin Saichen, which sadly is not available in English, though I would love to see it licensed someday. In comparison, Maki Miyako was much younger and completely self-taught. She was a teenager and her parents were booksellers, wholesalers. So she discovered shoujo manga by looking through her parents' wares and taking up a pen herself. She would make her professional debut in 1957 and she distinguished herself right away with a series of short stories and illustrations that all featured this very modern, comparatively speaking, elegant, almost doll-like style. Uh, she's also notable for the fact that she is married to Leiji Matsumoto. They actually married fairly early in their life. I think when she was 18 and he was 21. And early on in their marriage, they actually made shoujo manga together under the handle M and M Productions, where she would draw all the girls and he would draw all the guys and the cute animals because he was good at that. And while admittedly that partnership didn't last very long, these two remain married to this day. But Maki Miyako's career is as diverse as it is long. Uh, she would go on in the 1960s to help create Lika-chan, which is a popular Japanese fashion doll, very much in the same vein as Barbie. And later in her career, she become a notable Jose mangaka, which was not an uncommon career path for a lot of shoujo mangaka from this generation. Uh, meanwhile, Masaka Watanabe was a little older, but she was herself an art school graduate who had become a housewife and at this point a mother. But fortunately, her husband, who had been one of her classmates and a professional illustrator in his own right, had very liberal ideas about women's ability to work and he encouraged his wife to pursue a career in art. So with her newborn child in tow, she went off to the publishers to sell herself as a shoujo mangaka and she made her professional debut in 1952 and she became kind of the trendsetter of the time. She specialized in a lot of family dramas whether they were mothers and daughters or twin heroines that were usually separated by some melodramatic circumstance and then reunited. But part of what made her stories unique is that she had this very lush, cutesy, very Western influenced art style, but with this very delicate pastel coloring. And in fact, it was so popular that when I was looking for art for this panel, uh, it was hard to actually find examples of her manga because a lot of it ended up on merchandise of the time. Uh, she is actually still working to this day. She made a lot of shoujo horror stories in the 60s. She eventually made her way into Jose manga as well. And she actually has a series running today, you know, even though she is well into her 90s at this point. Now, these aren't the only examples of successful female shoujo mangaka of the time, but these are kind of the most prominent examples. So what did they have? that their male peers did not. Well, I think that this quote from a slightly later shoujo mangaka by the name of Machiko Satanaka sums it up pretty nicely. I thought I could do a better job myself and that women were capable of understanding what girls want better than men. 
Drawing comics was also a way of getting freedom and independence without having to go to school for years. It was something I could do by myself, and it was a type of work that allowed women to be equal to men. And I think that is really important, that it was very much an equal playing field. You didn't have to have a long education. You know, Maybe you could be a professional, but maybe you could be a housewife with an art school education. Maybe you could be a total amateur. But so long as you had some, some degree of talent and some ambition, you could become a successful shoujo mangaka, in part because you, these women could draw upon their own experiences, their own memories, their own preferences to craft something that their audience instinctively understood. Now, as the 1950s entered the 1960s, shoujo manga continued to skyrocket in popularity. And this is actually when we see uh, the debut of a lot of kind of the, the standard bearers of shoujo manga today. This is when magazines like Chao and Nakayoshi and Besatsu Friend are founded, just to name a few. And those that already existed actually started increasing their publishing frequency, in many cases going from quarterly or bimonthly or monthly to weekly. And because of that, there was a huge demand for more material to fill the, their pages. So many of these shoujo magazines started hosting contests for uh, reader submitted manga, where the winner would have their work published in the magazine. And thanks to this, a lot of new mangaka came out of this movement, and in many cases were making their debuts before they even graduated high school. And a lot of these new artists got support by the how-to books and columns that these manga magazines were publishing that helped give these young artists the tools and tips needed to make their own manga. Uh, an example of one of these how-to books you'll actually see here, although this is a slightly later example. This actually dates from the 1970s, but this gives you an idea of what they look like. But because of this, in the 1960s, we see kind of a second wave of new female shoujo mangaka who brought with them a lot of fresh new ideas about what shoujo manga could be, because in part, they were not far removed in age or perspective from their audience. And those changes were desperately needed because shoujo manga in the 50s had gone a little bit stagnant. As translator and scholar Rachel Thorne describes it, male cartoonists seem largely unable to imagine a heroine who is not under the age of 13 and almost entirely passive. And the most common storylines were tragedies that involved mothers. Heroines were always being separated from their biological mothers by death or other circumstances, and as often as not were abused or neglected by cruel, heartless stepmothers. They were buffeted about from one kind of misery to the next, patiently awaiting someone, usually a kind, handsome young man, to rescue them. And lest you think, well, Rachel Thorne is coming at this as an, oh, excuse me, <laughs> as an older woman who you know, is coming at this as a recent Searcher. Let's take a look at this quote, this other quote from Machiko Satanaka, who did grow up reading these sorts of manga. In those days, heroines in shoujo manga were of the irritating type. Whenever something happens, they would cry. But I wanted to tell those heroines, why don't you do something if you have the time to cry? So even the girls growing up reading this at the time were starting to feel a little frustrated with how passive these stories were. And so it's during this time that you start to see a shift within shoujo manga, moving away from these passive elementary aged heroines to more proactive teenage heroines, influenced in part by some early examples, such as uh, Princess Knight's Princess Sapphire, seen here. Uh, these sorts of heroines were referred to as otenba, or tomboys. And in many ways, they were similar to their predecessors. They were still very cute, very innocent, and very patient, but they were a little more strong-willed and more willing to face challenges head on, whatever they might be. And slowly but surely, this sort of heroine became the norm going into the 50s and into the 60s, to the point that these days, it's it's be very uncommon to you know not find a shoujo manga that isn't led by a spunky but spirited teen girl. <laughs> 
It's also during this time that shoujo manga started to diversify the kind of genres that could be found within it. It wasn't just weepy melodramas. You started to see a lot more comedies, a lot more fantasy stories, a lot more historical stories, and sports fiction. Which was kind of surprising because at the time in shonen manga, sports fiction was huge. But in comparison in shoujo manga, there wasn't a lot of it to be found. And the closest things that were present mostly featured a lot of very genteel and stereotypically feminine pursuits, such as horseback riding or ballet. Seriously, you have no idea how much ballet manga there was at the time. It was kind of ridiculous. But this would change after the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, because one of the biggest stories to come out of that was the Japanese women's volleyball team, who were, you know, this group of 20 to 30 something factory workers, you know, coached by a former army officer who managed to work their way up to the Olympics and win gold in the first year that women's volleyball was an event. And their story would go on to inspire um, a mangaka by the name of Chichako Urano to create one of shoujo manga's first blockbusters, 1968's Attack Number no. One. Now, on the surface, Attack Number no. One is not all that radically different from other sports manga of the time. Uh, it's about a young girl named Kozoe who turns out to have a talent for volleyball and then joins her school team. And eventually, they work their way up to regional, eventually national, and even international fame, all while Kozue and her friends deal with drama both on and off the court. But what made Attack Number One special was not necessarily found in the details of its plot, but instead the perspective that informed it. Now, as I implied before, in the early days of shoujo manga, the lot of a heroine was to nobly suffer, to endure whatever slings and arrows that life could throw at her until someone else came along to rescue her. But heroines like Kozue were not like that. Kozue came, overcame her own struggles, was, fa faced her struggles head on, and she overcame them not for the sake of others, not for the sake of setting an example, but for the sake of her own personal pride and the pride that others took in her. Just as the Japanese people could take pride and inspiration from their own Olympic volleyball team, so too could shoujo manga readers take inspiration from heroines like Kozoe and take pride and inspiration in their own lives from it. Attack number one was a sensation in its day. Uh, it uh, got an anime adaptation only a year after its debut. It kind of set off a mini trend of Olympic sports themed shoujo manga at this time. And it kind of set the precedent for a long series of shoujo sports stories. You know, everything from Aim to the Ace to Shoujo Fight. Heck, I think you could even argue that uh, Haikyuu, even though that is a shonen manga about volleyball, might not be as popular as it is, if not for the fact that, you know, you have generations of young girls who've been kind of schooled to uh, uh, associate volleyball with high personal drama. But those weren't the only changes happening in shoujo manga. Believe it or not, there was a time when romance was very rarely found in shoujo manga. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that their heroines tended to be prepubescent girls. If, if romance was present at all, it was something that happened to other characters, like older sisters, or the character was more far removed from everyday life. It was something like a fairy tale princess. But this started to change in the mid-1960s, thanks in part to the influence of a mangaka named Yoshiko Nishitani. She wrote a number of short stories during this time, but the one that's usually cited as kind of the game changer is 1966's Lemon and Cherry. Now, up to this point, Nishitani's work focused largely on uh, Western girls, girls from America or Europe who were leading these fabulous lives. But starting in the mid-1960s, she started to write stories about ordinary Japanese high school girls doing ordinary Japanese high school girl things. They went to class, they made friends, they joined clubs, and most importantly here, they started dating ordinary Japanese high school boys. And part of the reason that Nishitani could make these changes is because she and her editors recognized that shoujo manga's audience was starting to grow up alongside it. 
no longer was it primarily read by elementary age children. The, the audience metrics had kind of shifted once again, and now it was mostly consumed by teenage girls. And because of that, they get handled topics that were more relevant to a teen girl's life, including but not limited to romance and dating. You know, these days, shoujo romance is almost a cliche unto itself. But that's only because thousands upon thousands of mangaka have been refining upon the example that Nishitani set. But thanks in part to this expanding and uh, increasing the older audience, some artists started to get a little more ambitious with their shoujo manga. They wanted to tackle some heavier socially relevant topics and they really wanted to push the boundaries of what shoujo manga could do artistically. And if there is one artist who could be said to personify the ambition of that era, it absolutely would have to be Hideko Mizuno. Hideko Mizuno, like a lot of kids of that age, was inspired to make manga by the works of Osamu Tezuka. She knew she wanted to be a mangaka when she was nine years old. She entered her first manga contest when she was 12. And while she did not win, her talent and her young age were enough to attract the attention of the judges, who just so happened to be Osamu Tezuka and his regular editor. So they actually invited her out to their offices to meet with her and kind of discuss her work and encourage her. And this would be a fateful meeting for her in a couple of different ways. That same editor would come across some of her work when she was 16 and help her make her professional debut at that point, which is good because she was already at the point where she was ready to drop out of school to focus on her manga career. And a few years after that, uh, Sama Tezuka himself would invite her to become one of assistants and to move in into the Tokiwaso apartments. Now, this was no small honor. The Tokiwaso apartments were a sort of atelier that Tezuka had set up for some of his assistants in the 19, starting in the 1950s, where the conditions were kind of spartan and often kind of gross, and they didn't necessarily make a lot of money. But in return for working on, as his assistants whenever needed, they could spend the rest of their time working on their own original works. And Tezuka kind of handpicked some of the best and brightest mangaka of that day to serve as assistants. People like Shotaro Ishinomori were there, uh, Fujio Akasuka, the creator of Otsumatsu-kun, uh, the duo that would go on to create uh, Doraemon were there, just to name a few. And for one year, in 1958, Hideko Mizuno would become the first and only woman to join this group. And we know about that because like a lot of the people who lived and worked there, she made a manga about her time there. And while she was not necessarily impressed by the conditions, she did make some friends and professional connections there. And she actually uh, created some short uh, shoujo short stories with Shotaro Ishinomori and Fujio Akasuka under the handle of Yumiya. Uh, the example see here is An Angel in the Dark, which is a detective story. But she would not linger there for too long because you know, she was a young woman on the move, and she knew she wanted to do more with her career than just be an assistant, even if it was an assistant to her childhood idol. Right from the start, Hideko Mizuno knew that she didn't want to write the sort of weepy melodramas that were popular in shoujo manga when she was a little girl. She wanted to write the kind of stories that she would have wanted to read at that age. And so she did. Uh, many of her earliest stories were actually westerns, you know, very much in that kind of girl and pony style. And throughout the 1960s, she would work on a huge variety of stories, ranging on everything from epic medieval fantasies like 1960s Harp of the Stars to wacky world traversing comedies like, like Honey Honey's Wonderful Adventure. But as she continued to grow as an artist and kind of expand her ambition, it would eventually lead her to create what many consider to be her masterpiece, 1969's Fire. Now, Fire itself took inspiration from the story of the, the late singer Scott Walker, who had started out as this kind of 50s boy idol in, the, in I believe, the UK, and eventually became more of a hard rock star. 
as well as a later research trip she did to learn more about American culture and in particular counterculture of that of the late 1960s. Fire is about a young boy named Aaron Browning who's growing up in small town Ohio but accidentally gets himself thrown into uh, juvie, into juvenile detention, where he meets up with a delinquent rock singer by the name of, I believe, Firewolf. And this inspires Aaron to become a musician. So when he gets out of juvie, he makes his way to Detroit. He puts together a band. They become popular. But as soon as they become popular, things start to fall apart due to various infighting and drama among the members, as well as Aaron's deteriorating mental health. Fire was a first in a lot of ways. It was the first shoujo manga to feature a male protagonist. Uh, It dealt with a lot of heavy subject matter of the time, things like racism and suicide and drug use. Uh, It was the first shoujo manga to feature a sex scene, even though it was a tasteful fade to black. And because of this, most of the shoujo manga magazines of the time would not carry it. It was a little too extreme for their readership. So it would actually be published in the Japanese uh, edition of Seventeen magazine, starting in 1969. But this actually worked out to its advantage because that helped Fire reach audiences it might not have reached otherwise. Not only some older readers, but more uh, more male readers as well. Fire was very popular in its day, and it was also a huge critical uh, success. And Hideko Mizuno would become just the second woman to win the Shogakukan Manga Award in 1970 for it. But Fire was also in many ways kind of a triumph for her as an artist. Now what you see here are just a small selection of various uh, pages from her manga, ranging from her earliest days in the, the late 1950s all the way up to the late 60s. And you can see right from the start that she was a very talented artist and she was very skillful at using her art and layout and things like that to create particular moods, you know, whether that be dreamlike or very intense and romantic or kind of punchy and comedic. But with Fire, she took her art to new levels. Again here, these are just a few pages to serve as examples, but you can see how much she's grown as an artist and kind of developed her own uh, character style, one that didn't necessarily wear its Tesca influence on its sleeve. But she's also started to experiment with things like perspective, with inking, uh, incorporating elements of psychedelica to create something that was still recognizable as shoujo manga, but something a lot more artistic and complex than anything else seen up to this point. Fire would go on to become an incredibly influential manga. Uh, Again, uh, artists like Motohagio and Keiko Takamiya were big fans of Mizuno and would cite Fire as an influence on their own work just a few years afterwards. Uh, later scholars have looked to Fire and other similar works by Mizuno from the time and seen with it uh, to some degree some of the origins of Jose Manga because of its focus on more ma- mature perspectives and uh, societal issues. Others have looked at the relationship between Aaron and Firewolf and seen within within it the first stirrings of the genre that would soon become to be known as boys love. Now, Mizuno's career would continue well after Fire. She would actually take a break for a while in the early 70s to become a single mother. And she would eventually uh, go on to make a number of other shoujo and jose manga. She would do illustrations for Japanese releases of a number of different singles, among many other things. But Fire in particular was kind of a breaking point in shoujo manga. And the ripples from its impact can still be felt within it, within shoujo manga to this day. But that... At this point, you have to be wondering, certainly as I did, how is this a lost generation? You know, how can all of these women with all of their works and all their stories, how could all of this fall so deep into obscurity as to virtually be lost to history? And the answer is, is that there is no one single answer to this. It's a number of factors working in conjunction with one another. And one of the most prominent is the fact that 
not all of these early shoujo manga were ever collected into volumes. The whole idea of collecting serialized chapters into Tonkaban didn't really catch on in manga until like 1967, 1968. And because of that, only the most popular series from the decade or so previous to that got that treatment. And even when they did, the print runs tended to be fairly small and they didn't get reprinted as much as other shoujo manga works even five years later. And this is part of the reason that, you know, artists like the Magnificent 49ers in the 1970s kind of stuck around in cultural memory versus their predecessors. Now that's not to say that there haven't been any modern re-releases, but when they have been made, they are often very expensive and in very small runs. And the example you see here is a bit of an extreme one. Uh, this is a modern reprint of She Wore a Blue Ribbon, Shotara Ishinomori's debut work. You know, it's this big, beautiful coffee table sized book with a whole bunch of color illustrations. And they only made 150 copies. And its retail price was the equivalent of just around $500 American. So yeah, this is an extreme example, but it's not uncommon. These, these sorts of modern re-releases are rare, and when they are made, they are made more for researchers, for libraries, and for hardcore collectors, not necessarily for your everyday consumer. But what all of this means is that the vast majority of shoujo manga made in the 1950s and 60s were never re released side of their original magazine run. And unfortunately, it's not like the artists can just go back to their original art and publish it themselves, because in most cases, that doesn't exist anymore. As Hideko Mizuno noted herself in the late 2000s, in those days, there were no use for manuscripts uh, after they were published, since there wasn't a custom of compiling them and making a single story book. Editors didn't seem to realize how precious manuscripts were. Although I asked many times that they return my manuscripts, they never came back. I was simply told, we don't know where they are. And that was it. Because there wasn't a custom of compiling these chapters and publishing them later, the publishers made no effort to archive the original manuscripts. So they would often be cut up and altered and colored for advertisements. Some of them might be given away as prizes to readers and contests. But in a lot of cases, they were simply thrown away. In the same interview I quote here, Mizuno notes how she has had to work for years with a lot of her fans to help hunt down what surviving manuscript pages are still there. And in some cases, she has even hired an artist to kind of trace the original magazine pages to fill in the gaps. And in that sense, she is very fortunate because there is no complete archive of a lot of these early shoujo magazines. While many of them are still published to this day, the publishers themselves do not retain an archive of the actual physical volumes. What collections are out there are scattered between various private collectors, uh, public and university libraries, and government archives, like the Diet for the sake of copyright. So not all of them are publicly accessible. Then there's the fact that we're talking about cheaply made mass market magazines from well over half a century ago. These were not books and magazines that were printed to last. And with each year, they become a little more fragile and a little more rare. So you also have to deal with the complexities of either physically preserving these books or trying to digitize them. And of course, both of those require time, staff, effort, and money that may or may not be available. There's even an element of academic bias that is kind of fed into this because you didn't really see Japanese researchers starting to discuss shoujo manga until the 1970s. And that only really started to change once the Magnificent 49ers started to get popular. Now, these critics were dazzled by the works of those artists, but they also kind of applied a bit of a double standard to them. Like they considered them so good that they were almost beyond shoujo manga of the time, much less what came before it. And they regarded the shoujo manga that came before them as lesser, just, you know, 
too silly, too frivolous, too femme to be bothered with. And unfortunately, some of this bias kind of bled into some of the early works by uh, Western critics and academics when they started to write about shoujo manga, whether wittingly or unwittingly, because they used these early literary critics as sources for their own works. Now, there has been more of an effort made in the last couple of decades on both sides of the Pacific uh, to better document and study early shoujo manga, but these efforts do remain pretty fragmentary out of Japan. But the last and final factor is probably the most unavoidable of them all. And that's the fact that all of these people involved are getting older. The women who made all these manga are now in their 70s or 80s, and in some cases, even older. And the same is true for their audience. In a generation, maybe two, these women will start to die from the ravages of old age. And when that happens, these works and their names and their stories will start to fade from living memory. And that's the point where there is a very real danger that these works won't just be obscure, but that some of them will start to fade out entirely from recorded history. And that's why, to me, it is so important that people all over the world be they fans, be they scholars, be they enthusiasts, do their part to help preserve these works, to discuss and study them, and when and wherever possible, distribute them so that these works and all these women and their stories don't disappear. You know, ultimately, it is up to the shoujo manga fans and scholars of today to help preserve its past so that future readers and scholars and enthusiasts can study it and better understand its origins. All right, uh, just a few things before we head into the Q&A, a little housekeeping. Uh, first of all, uh, I do regular manga reviews at my blog, The Manga Test Drive, which is mangatestdrive.blogspot.com. I've been doing that for over nine years now. I also have a side blog called Renaissance Jose, which is renaissancejose.blogspot.com, where I do longer form essays and reviews and things, uh, particularly discussing either the anime Rama films recently or bad anime. Uh, I am an occasional contributor to Anime Feminist, where I've made a number of podcast appearances and written a few articles, uh, including an article of the same name that was actually the inspiration for this particular panel. Uh, finally, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at Brainchild129. And if you like what I do here or elsewhere enough that you want to give me money on the regular for it, you can do so on Patreon at Megan D. And with that, I think that covers everything. And I'm ready to open things up to the Q&A. That was a great panel. Thank you. Uh, we'll give the chat some time to catch up. And uh, I'll read any questions that pop up as they do. A lot of people saying thank you for the presentation. Great job. Thank uh, you. 10 out of 10. Uh, amazing work. Somebody just spammed cat emojis. <laughs> I don't mind that at all. Oh, yeah, Daryl. We're, we're letting people uh, use webcams if they want to this year. I changed my mind last minute. Um, meanwhile... While we uh, wait for questions, I, I can actually show off if people are interested, if they want to do further uh, research or reading on their own. Some, I have some recommendations. Uh, first of all, if you're going to do any, anything about the history of manga, you kind of have to start at the beginning, which is Frederick Schott's Manga Manga, The World of Japanese Comics. This is admittedly an older book. This was originally written in the early 1980s, but it's still one of the best sources on the history of manga particularly its early days. Uh, another one I found useful was International Perspectives on Shoujo and Shoujo Manga, The Influence of Girl Culture, which is edited by Masami Toku. Uh, this is an academic book. Uh, it's got some good articles in here about early Shoujo Manga, but in particular, it has a lot of profiles and interviews with a lot of the artists I discussed. So some really fascinating material in here. Uh, secondly, uh, there's Passionate Friendship, The Aesthetics of Girls' Culture in Japan by Deborah Shamoon. Shamoon is one of the 
a few uh, scholars who regularly writes about early shoujo manga. Uh, this one in particular not only covers early shoujo magazines, but also kind of the origins of yuri manga, which if people are, because there's a lot of overlap between that, and if people are interested in that, I'm pretty sure Erica Friedman will be discussing uh, more of this at her panel tomorrow. Uh, another fairly recent one is The Age of Shoujo, The Emergence, Evolution, and Power of Japanese Girl Magazine Fiction by Hiromi Tsuchiya Dales. Uh, this is another one that really gets into kind of sh the origins of shoujo culture and talks about early shoujo magazines. And finally, this is less of a resource and a little bit more of a brag. Um, I don't know if you could tell from how much I discussed her, but I'm kind of a fan of Hideko Mizuno, about as much as you can be without, you know, actually being able to read Japanese. And she actually uh, released an art book, if I hold it up right properly, uh, last year. You can actually pretty rarely get this on eBay. That... Uh, shows off a lot of her early works like it reprints her her debut story in full um it shows off a lot of like color covers and pages from her manga let's see oh here's an example of some of the covers she did for like singles in japan in the 1970s mostly this one i believe is kisses god of thunder oh there's a few other beautiful examples in here like for Devo uh, for Queen down here in the corner this absolutely beautiful one for Carol King's tapestry along with some of her more uh, recent artwork which uh, takes a lot of inspiration from like ballet and opera it's, it's just really good stuff she's a cool lady I really wish we could get some of her work in English Okay, we do have some questions now. Let me see. Uh, Jadine Ryan, I hope I'm saying that right. Do you think there's a possibility for boutique manga publishers to bring these to America? I'm assuming that for re-release, most of the pages are reprinted from the magazine versions, and then they ask if it's possible to clean up the pages. I mean, it's certainly possible, but the trick is if you just scan the magazine pages, you're not going to get as high quality as you do with... Uh, scanning the original manuscripts mm -hmm. as for, I mean, I'd certainly love a, a more boutique publisher to try their hand at it. I mean, it seems like the kind of thing you'd be more likely to see something like Fantagraphics or drawn and quarterly take up since they publish a lot of older manga themselves. I mean, God knows if I had any influence in the manga <laughs> industry, I would be out there trying to sell publishers on either fire or Harper, the stars, like a door to door salesman. Like, I really wish I could read those in English because they have been republished uh, in Japan. They got like omnibus editions in like the late 90s, early 2000s. So, and uh, actually, a lot of Mizuno's work is available uh, online through eBooks Japan if you can read Japanese and kind of work around the payment system. So, it, it's out there. There's digital files, at least in her case. Uh, this is from Rassus. Were any of these works adapted into other media like anime or would that be part of why there's uh, that they're lost to the ages? That is also part of it. There are a few anime adaptations. I had already mentioned Attack uh, Number 1, which was adapted into an anime in 1969. Um, there's a YouTuber by the name of Marion B. B.E.A. -E who did a great video on the Attack Number 1 anime. I recommend seeking that out. Um, Honey Honey actually got an um, anime adaptation in 1981 that apparently aired on the Christian Broadcast Network back in the day. <laughs> uh, that's never received a home video release, but there are uh, recordings of various episodes. Some of them, I believe, are up on archive.org. Um, I'm trying to think of any others offhand. I don't think there are many, many um, anime adaptations because the whole idea of shoujo anime was still fairly new in the mid to late 60s, and a lot of it focused on Magical Girl series. Uh, Wandering Dreamer asks if you could repost the list of those books on Twitter after your oh, panel. Oh, absolutely. I will do that, and I will do so in the Discord as well. Um, let me see. Uh, Durenthal, uh, it says they may have come in late or may have missed it. Are there any specific preservation efforts? Uh, we've, we've kind of talked about that a little bit. I, I don't know if there's any like specific initiatives. A lot of it is kind of done on an individual or um, institution basis. 
And I think the only one that's made an effort in the States is Ohio State University. Because they actually have a pretty decent uh, manga collection. And they have actually done a few exhibits here on shoujo manga. But th those are well into the past. Um, we are just about out of time. Um, I guess the most, most overwhelming message I'm getting from the chat is that they loved your panel. Um, Thank you. It's, it's mostly been comments thanking you for, uh, for sharing this. Um, did you, you have anything you want to promote before we call it? Uh, nothing that I didn't already do so, but you know, thank you all for coming out and watching this. This this panel is kind of my baby. I put a lot of love and work into it, and I'm really glad that people appreciated it. Well, I, I really appreciate you doing this. You have a nice rest of your day. Cheers. You too.